Welcome to Premier League Match Pack, your weekly guide to all the stats that matter. 240 games have been played so far this season, with the battle to remain in the top flight heating up. The goal tally now stands at 683, with 28 scored last Saturday, prior to the six fired in on Sunday. The hat-trick tally stands at seven, following Romelu Lukaku's second of the campaign, which was also the 300th hat-trick in Premier League history. While Manchester City's late strike against Swansea City was the 12th winning goal scored in the 90th minute or later. After a shock defeat at Hull City last time out, Liverpool's season is in danger of unravelling. The Reds have failed to win any of their five league games since the turn of the year, falling 13 points behind leaders Chelsea and in turn being leapfrogged by this weekend's opponents Tottenham Hotspur. Jurgen Klopp is currently on his longest winless league run as Liverpool boss and now holds an identical record to predecessor Brendan Rodgers after his first 54 top flight games in charge. Indeed, with Klopp possessing only the fifth best win percentage of Liverpool's Premier League managers, the German could find himself under pressure if their current form continues. If you're a manager and you're struggling for a sort of title running, you've got to try and, you know, try and win a trophy. If you're Jurgen Klopp, you know, he lost two trophies last year, perfect time for him to get a trophy this year and then finish top four, then all of a sudden it's a good season, it's a positive season, something to build on. Now he's just left with the Premier League, so it's imperative that he finishes in the top four because anything outside of that is a bit of a disaster. While the visit of second place Spurs presents another difficult task, Klopp will be encouraged by the London club's poor away record against other leading sides this season. Mauricio Pochettino's men have failed to win any of their games so far at fellow teams in the top eight, which will be music to the ears of Jorginho Wijnaldum in particular. The Dutchman has scored all 14 of his Premier League goals in home matches, including a double against Spurs in his final game for former club Newcastle United last season. Despite that formidable record, his manager will no doubt want the midfielder to replicate that form away from Anfield sooner rather than later. It's a bizarre record to have. I mean, I was a goal scorer in midfield playing. And it, it, it didn't phase me whether I was playing at home or away. It was, uh, uh, you know, my thought process was, process was the same. You know, try and get assists, try and get chances, get the odd goal. If you get double figures, great. But I, I can't remember too many players that have just scored at home, but he needs to try and get that monkey off his back because Liverpool need his goals. Wijnaldum will be one of a number of attack-minded players hoping to make a clear impact in this game, including a pair of flying fullbacks. Nathaniel Klein and Kyle Walker have each played a prominent role on the right flank for their respective sides, both going forward and in defence. The pair have missed just one game apiece this season, with the England international colleagues similarly matched in terms of their defensive contribution. But having assisted three more goals than his Liverpool counterpart, Walker seems to have taken his game to a new level. Quick. He's, he's, he's very strong, he's quite aggressive, he's got a good attitude. His positional sense over the last 18 months has certainly improved in my opinion. Sometimes when he was when he was younger he got caught out of position because he was so quick and because he could recover and get back into his position. Now all of a sudden he's got the legs, he can go box to box, he can play as a wing back when needed as well, so he's a player that's certainly improving. With Liverpool boasting a strong record in games against other members of the current top six this season, Walker and co will have to be at their best. The Reds have picked up the same number of points as leaders Chelsea from such fixtures, having played one game fewer. History also suggests Spurs may struggle to come away from Anfield with a victory. The Londoners have won just two of the 24 previous meetings between these sides on Merseyside. But Pochettino will know how important three points could be as they look to close the gap, a considerable one, on Chelsea. Nine behind nothing in the Premier League. I've seen teams come back from 12, 15, you know, from, from when you get a little momentum towards the end of the season, it can be done. It just needs Chelsea to lose one, Tottenham win, and all of a sudden you're six behind. What it does do for Tottenham, I think it firmly nails Liverpool at the title race. Um, if they take three points of Liverpool, Liverpool are 13 behind at the moment. They can't go 16 behind, so Pochettino will know he's taken one big horse out of the race if he beats Liverpool. Tabletoppers Chelsea maintained their nine-point lead after defeating London rivals Arsenal. 
But a tough task awaits them this weekend as they face a Burnley side who've relied on their form at Turf Moor since their return to the top flight. With nine home wins all season, only two sides can boast a better home record than the Clarets. Part of their success could be down to Sean Dyche's favoured long pass approach. Burnley have played more of those passes than any other team this season. But can they crack a solid Chelsea defence? Obviously, Chelsea play three at the back. It's no surprise, but I think um, with with the long ball approach, if they play it forward quickly, and they've got players like Sam Vokes, with Gray, you know, down the size of a, of a three at the back, they can offer that threat. But it just needs to get a, get the ball forward quick. Um, in turnovers, in transition, they won't be looking to play through midfield. I think Burnley obviously look to get the ball forward, and, and that's what they'll look to do again in this game. Standing in the way of the Clarets will be Nemanja Matic. He's thrived alongside N'Golo Conte, allowing him more attacking freedom, leading to his highest tally of assists for a Premier League season. He's also made the third highest amount of tackles for the Blues. Burnley go in search of their first Premier League win over Chelsea, but they did take the lead in the last meeting at Turf Moor in August 2014. Diego Costa scored three minutes later on his Premier League debut, and that kick-started a Chelsea comeback, a perfect beginning for them to a title-winning campaign. Much was made of Jose Mourinho's relationship with Juan Mata before the start of the season, but at Manchester United, the Spaniard has thrived regardless of the history with his manager. Last weekend, Mata scored his fifth of the campaign, the 86th goal he's been involved with since his Premier League debut for Chelsea back in August 2011. That's more than any other midfielder in that time. United's dominant 3-0 win over champions Leicester City means they're unbeaten in their last 15 league games, their longest run since March 2013. It's the 11th occasion they've gone as long without defeat in the competition, but the first time they've done so since the retirement of Sir Alex Ferguson. Their opponents, Watford, have set their own landmark record. As for the first time in their Premier League history, they've scored more than one goal in three consecutive games. The most recent saw Mbai Niang register a goal and an assist, the 10th time a Watford player has done so in the same league game, and all this on his home debut for the Hornets. After a run of seven Premier League games without a win, Watford are celebrating back-to-back -back triumphs for the first time since September, when they beat this weekend's opponents at Vicarage Road. Their last away game damaged Arsenal's chances of winning the title. Can Walter Mazzari's Hornets now do the double over Manchester United and dent their hopes of a top-four finish? West Ham United's victory against Southampton was Slaven Bilic's 25th Premier League managerial win. He's achieved that milestone in just 62 games, quicker than any of his predecessors at the London club. His opponent this weekend is Tony Pulis, who's seen his West Bromwich Albion side flourish. After 24 games, they have their best ever points tally, while their 10 wins is the same total as at this stage in 2012-13. They're eighth in the table, which would equal their best ever finish, but Pulis has higher aspirations. Getting into that top six or seven is not easy, especially these days in the Premier League. With the quality of teams that are up there, um, they're doing exceptionally well this season. I think they'll look to reinvest again in the summer. They've done some business in January, but I think he'll look to try and rebuild again in the summer and improve the squad even more. And if they can do that, then, then why not? But it's an awfully hard task to, to get into that top six. Robert Snodgrass has been signed as a replacement for Dimitri Payet at West Ham. Both are hugely influential players, although Payet's goals were directly responsible for only seven of the Iron's 62 points last season. Snodgrass had already matched that figure this campaign for Hull City. The Scottish international also likes to play against West Brom. With three goals against the Baggies in five meetings, they are, along with Southampton, his joint favourite Premier League opponents. He's got big shoes to fill. I think he's a very good player, very good at set pieces. Uh, creative, uh, creative wise, he's, he's very good for the likes of Andy Carroll. He gets crosses into the box. Pae would be a big miss for West Ham. He was brilliant last season. Probably not as good this season, but he still will be a, a big hole in the side, but hopefully Robert Snodgrass will be able to fill that. Snodgrass will be looking to supply West Ham's aerial threat. Both of these sides score a large proportion of their goals from headers. Of all the goals scored by the Baggies this season, over a third have come from headed attempts, the highest ratio in the league. 
Salomon Rondon scored a hat-trick of headed goals against Swansea earlier this season. But since the start of the last campaign, no player has been more effective in the air than Mikel Antonio with 12 headed goals. Andy Carroll is also an aerial threat. He scored four goals in as many games, including a headed effort against Middlesbrough. He scored lots of goals in recent weeks. Uh, before that, the team weren't playing to his strengths. The likes of Aaron Questwell has been a bit quiet, um, not getting pulled into the box often as he did last season. But I think the introduction of Snodgrass, um, Fagoli's playing well now for West Ham. Um, they'll get more balls into the box and it'll aid Andy Carroll. The same with Rondon at uh, uh, West Brom, Tony Pulis, who I know him well from my days at Stoke, will definitely tell the, the wingers to get crosses into the box on a, on a regular basis, and if they do that, Rondon will score goals as well. West Ham's 3-1 away victory at Southampton continued a string of high-scoring games involving the Hammers. Village's side have had several big defeats and wins since December the 26th, and will be hoping to exact revenge on a baggy side who beat them 4-2 earlier this season. Games in the East End of London are normally much tighter. At the Berlin ground, five of the last six meetings ended in a draw. Maybe the Hammers' new stadium will be home to a more decisive result. West Ham will have to improve in front of goal when playing on their own turf. They currently have the lowest shot conversion rate at home in the league. Middlesbrough are the only team this season to have scored fewer goals than the Hammers in front of their own fans. They can get in the top half definitely and, and that'll be a decent season considering where they were in the early part of the season. I think, I think that'll be the fine for Slavin Bilic and they can reinvest again in the summer and, and get used to that new stadium. I think that's key for everybody involved, for the fans and the players to get used to it and uh, get that as a fortress again as Upton Park was. Crystal Palace's hopes of survival suffered another blow last weekend, falling to their fifth defeat under Sam Allardyce, with only goal difference separating the Eagles from the bottom of the table. Meanwhile, Stoke City's loss to West Bromwich Albion was their first in five games, a result that saw them drop down to 11th in the league. If the Potters are to bounce back, they'll need Charlie Adam to return to the form he showed last month. In January, the midfielder recorded three assists in just three games, equaling Stoke's highest tally for the campaign alongside Marco Arnautovic. Mark Hughes will be well aware of Palace's record on the road this season. They've picked up 12 of their 19 points in away fixtures, with Allardyce himself admitting concern with his side's performances at Selhurst Park. I think at home he... He just wants to avoid losing the game. He wants to make sure that the fans are behind them and that they play quite a negative style of football at home. Whereas away from home, I just think the fullbacks join in in attack. They allow Zaha and Townsend to get forward a lot more in attacking positions. And I suppose they allow having three centre backs at the back to, to, to offer the balance. Whereas the wing backs go and offer the, the width and depth in attack. And that's what you can see away from home. They're, they're a lot more attack minded. Whereas at home, they're a little bit more negative and defensive. With the Eagles away record in mind, Allardyce may be confident considering the side have won each of the previous two meetings at the Bet365 Stadium. Back in December 2015, Lee Chung Yong opened his Palace account in style, scoring from distance late on to send the visitors level on points with fourth place Tottenham Hotspur. After Peter Crouch became the oldest player to score 100 Premier League goals, for our matchback question this week, we'd like to know who's the youngest. Keep watching. As always, the answer is coming up later in the show. Despite scoring three times at Everton last weekend, AFC Bournemouth fell to yet another defeat. Eddie Howe's team went behind to what was the joint fastest goal of the season so far, as Romelu Lukaku put his side into the lead after a mere 30 seconds. That result was the Cherries' third loss in their five Premier League games this calendar year. Only champions Leicester City have picked up fewer points since the 1st of January. In that period, Bournemouth have shipped 16 goals, more than any other side. The Cherries' dismal run extends back further than the new year, though. In their first 12 top-flight games this season, they let in just 16 goals. But in the 12 that followed, that figure almost doubled. They're scoring more regularly at the right end, however, but their priority must be to ensure that goals turn into points. 
it's difficult because obviously the, the, the Premier League gets stronger all the time and if you stand still for a minute um, you seem to get gobbled up and left behind so I feel Eddie Howe's got to keep his players um, focused on the, on the job at hand, keep on trying to improve and keep on evolving as players and as a team and if they can do that they should be okay. Bournemouth's on-field discipline has certainly been a positive. They've committed fewer fouls than any other team in the division this season, yet have been on the receiving end of the most. That figure could rise as they line up against Manchester City, who are not afraid of a challenge and have earned themselves the most red cards in the league so far this term. Hoping to help keep City quiet will be Harry Arter. The Irish international has won more tackles and completed more passes than any of his teammates this campaign. Arter scored his first goal of the season against Everton, but arguably should have had more as no Cherries player has attempted more shots at goal so far this term. For me, I'd like to see him intercept a lot more balls, um, maybe a little bit more protection for his back four and instead of getting into the faces of the opposition midfield and making actual tackles. Sometimes that's necessary, especially when it's emergency defending situations. But in general, I'd like him to do a bit more shielding um, and do a little bit more intercepting. Um, but he's de definitely very useful for the side. He's a leader, he's got plenty of energy and he's got good quality on the ball as well when you've got possession. One of the big decisions facing Pep Guardiola is whether to reintroduce Sergio Aguero to his side. The Argentine has only made cameo appearances in City's last two league outings, with Guardiola opting to give Gabriel Jesus the nod. Perhaps surprisingly, the Manchester outfit fare better without Aguero in the team this season, making selection a tricky issue. One man perhaps more likely of a spot in Guardiola's starting 11 will be Raheem Sterling. The England international has bagged four goals in his two top-flight appearances against the Cherries, including his first-ever Premier League hat-trick in October 2015. The pacey forward will be expected to start on Monday. I feel it's, it's one of them where you play against a team, sometimes you just real, feel really comfortable playing against them, and it's probably a good chance he's going to do it again. I think Man City will have probably 70, 60-70% of possession. Uh, the forward three look really, really lively at the moment, and I feel Raheem's uh, a good form um, and he, he's probably likely to get in the goals on this sheet. It's not just Sterling that Bournemouth need to be wary of. In their previous three Premier League meetings, the South Coast side has shipped 13 goals. The last team to concede four or more goals in four consecutive top flight games against one opponent was Watford against Everton between 1984 and 1985. Those dominant displays when facing the Cherries mean Manchester City have scored more goals per game versus Howe's team on average than against any other side in the competition's history. But even with City's abundance of firepower, some suggest Eddie Howe and his men shouldn't necessarily be written off just yet. We've got lots of options, Man City, but I just feel if your communication's right, you're delaying tactics, you shape your formation, you can uh, limit Man City to um, little chance, and if you can do that, you've got a great chance to keep them quiet. It's going from bad to worse for Middlesbrough. For the second time this season, Aitor Karanka's side failed to have a single shot on target in a Premier League game. In total, the side have registered just 56 shots on target since their return to the top flight, at least 16 fewer than any other team. The loss to Tottenham Hotspur was their 11th of the campaign, while at home the side will have to improve their performances if they're to pull clear of the relegation zone. Their last home game resulted in a draw with West Bromwich Albion, their ninth overall this season. No team has registered more. Finding the back of the net has been no trouble for a player expected to line up against them on Saturday. Romelu Lukaku's four-goal haul last weekend took his league tally with Everton to 59, one shy of the club's leading Premier League goalscorer, Duncan Ferguson. The Belgian has also propelled himself to the top of this season's goal-scoring chart. Everton's emphatic win over Bournemouth extended their unbeaten run to seven games, their longest stretch since 2014. While it was also a fitting way for Ronald Koeman to celebrate his 100th Premier League match as a manager. After a run of six Premier League away games without a win, the Toffees are unbeaten in their last four on the road. Despite a narrow defeat to Manchester City last weekend, Swansea City are hovering just above the bottom three. But while they continue to show improvements under head coach Paul Clement, the same can't be said for Leicester City. The Premier League champions have fallen to four consecutive league defeats, but could be boosted by their FA Cup replay win over Derby County on Wednesday. 
Claudio Ranieri's side will definitely need to improve their shooting quality. In their last seven league games, 34 of their 54 shots have been off target, the third lowest accuracy of all teams in that period. They also remain the only side yet to score in the Premier League in 2017. This year there's questions to be asked, and especially now with the African Cup of Nations finished and Mario's coming back, Slomani coming back, Moose at the pace. They're the players they need back in the team. They need to offer something because in the last four games they haven't scored a goal and they, I think they need to progress now and start getting goals. At the back, both Lukas Fabianski and Kasper Schmeichel played vital parts for their teams in the previous campaign. However, this season the two keepers have each seen a drop in their save percentages. Indeed, Swansea have conceded more goals than any other side. Fabianski will be hoping Riyad Mahrez has a much quieter afternoon than when the two sides last met at the Liberty Stadium. The Algerian put in a man-of-the-match display in South Wales last season, scoring all three goals in a win that sent the Foxes to the top of the table. Earlier in the programme, we asked who was the youngest player to have reached the 100-goal mark in the Premier League. The answer? Former Liverpool forward Michael Owen. At the age of 23 years and 133 days, he scored his 100th top-flight goal in their 6-0 win over West Bromwich Albion. Even though their title aspirations have been dented, Arsenal can still point to their aerial threat as a positive sign this season. Olivier Giroud's late strike in the 3-1 defeat to Chelsea was the Gunners' 13th-headed goal of the campaign. But their success in the air doesn't make up for the fact that they're now 12 points behind the league leaders. Their fourth defeat in nine Premier League games is the same number as they'd registered in their previous 35 matches in the competition. While at home, they suffered their first loss in 11 league games when succumbing to Watford at the end of January. So it may be the perfect time for Arsene Wenger's side to regroup as they welcome a team they put four past earlier in the season. But while the Gunners may be lacking a bit of self-belief, their opponents Hull City are proving a lack of possession doesn't always result in defeat. In their match with Liverpool last weekend, they enjoyed just 28% of the ball, but still emerged victorious 2-0. In fact, the Tigers have failed to win any of the six games where they've had the lion's share of possession this season. There's little doubt that Marco Silva has had a positive effect on Hull. Since his appointment, he's won seven points from his first four Premier League games, as many as the Tigers claimed in the 18 fixtures prior to his arrival. The next challenge is to overturn their poor performances on the road, with the team picking up just one away win all season. Sunderland put an end to their six-game winless run in style last weekend, beating relegation rivals Crystal Palace. They'll now look to make it back-to-back -back victories for the first time since November. Quite the opposite for their visitors Southampton. Consecutive defeats have seen them drop to 13th, six places lower than their position at this stage last season. But despite sitting at the bottom of the table, David Moyes will be pleased with his side's ability to find the net when playing at the Stadium of Light. The Black Cats have scored in nine of their 12 home games this season, a higher tally than each of the teams in the bottom six. I think the fans of the stadium are fantastic. Um, they, they, they support the team. Uh, the momentum builds at, at the stadium and like when, when someone are, are, are pressing and, and really kind of pressuring the team to win the ball back and in transition they do really well. Against Watford they obviously beat us up there 1-0 um, and that was the fullback who scored the goal and that just proves um, you know, the fullbacks do join in and attack. When they do attack, they all t attack together. That Sunderland pressure is something that the Saints will be wary of, especially as they've conceded at least two goals in five of their last seven games. Maya Yoshida has become a vital part of their backline, averaging more aerial duels per game than his defensive teammates. Southampton hold a slight advantage in their head-to-head -head record, and in their last two meetings at the Stadium of Light, both teams recorded a win each via the penalty spot. In May 2015, two Jordi Gomez goals gave Sunderland the three points, and last season it was Dusan Tadic's turn as the Saints won 1-0. Arsenal against Hull kicks off the seven games taking place on Saturday. Later, Everton face Middlesbrough, Liverpool host Tottenham. Two matches on Sunday, Burnley welcome the leaders Chelsea and Swansea line up against Leicester. On Monday, Bournemouth and Manchester City round off match week 25. One of the players emerging as an early contender for player of the season is Chelsea's N'Golo Conte. 
Since his Premier League debut for Leicester at the start of the 2015-16 season, he's made more tackles than any other player. And this campaign, he's made and won more tackles in a single game than any other individual, establishing himself as a key figure at Stamford Bridge. A central factor in the Foxes' incredible achievement last season, he's on course to become the first outfield player to win consecutive Premier League titles with different clubs. From Dave Farrer, me, John Champion, and the rest of the Matchback team, it's goodbye.